Hey folks and welcome back. So this video is kind of super exciting because if you followed me for, I don't know, since 2010 or six or eight, whenever I started doing these videos, you know that I'll work on a project uh, for a certain amount of time, then I'll put it on pause and then I'll finish the project. And I think the reason I do that is because as I'm, you can only design so much on the front front end of a completely made up aircraft that when you start to actually develop it and build it, you know, I always try to start with prototypes and then I roll that prototype into actually flying hardware if it works out good. If not, I throw the prototype away and build a, a bigger, better or whatever. But for some reason with me, the way my brain works is that I'm never going to enter into a part of a project that I, I'm not liking the project. So if I start to get stressed out or feel anxieties, I'll just put it on pause and work on something else. And it might be for a month. It could be a half a year. It could be a year. It could be two years. But this project is called the Fra Emmestein. And the reason I'm calling it that, and if you go back and look at some of the earlier videos, it's going to be a 220 inch wingspan, insane made up fantasy plane. That's a cargo plane. The RC plane I'm building is going to have an eight foot long cargo bay and be able to carry around 40 pounds of cargo that I can drop out the back with parachutes and stuff. But also the reason this airplane was built is so if my friends with drones could fly up to the back of the drone, the, the airplane with the ramp open and land their drones in the back of the airplane and then take them back off. The airplane also has a whole bunch of stuff in it that I've always wanted to put in a model airplane. So it's going to have leading edge devices, okay? And there's some trolls out there that said the way I'm doing it's never been done. And there's differences in the way leading edge devices work. Some of them are on tracks that come in and out of the wing. Some droop on a pivot. Mine are the drooping kind. They actually droop on a pivot. And I'll touch base a little bit about that. Um, not so much in this video. This is an overview video. But this airplane the air the airframe is coming back into my shop in July uh, hopefully maybe even as soon as next weekend okay but this airplane got to about 80 percent done and I realized I was going grossly overweight for my design so the outboard sections of the wing I'm throwing away starting all over um, with a built up balsa carbon fiber design with fiberglass skins so I'm super excited to go down that path the completion date of this airplane will be probably March of, of 2023. Uh, definitely going to be at CEF next year. But let's, let's get going a little bit about this airplane, okay? So uh, essentially, this airplane is going to be a airplane. It started as a concept of what you're seeing in this CAD drawing here, where it had three engines or three electric motors, had two pushers on the wing, had one pusher on the tail. That has evolved now into two tractors on the wing. So over here, two tractor on the wing, two tractor engines, and two pusher engines, and maybe or maybe not an engine on the tail. I have not made up my mind 100% of how that's going to work. Okay, before I get too far into this, I wanna talk about one of my supporters. It's rlfasteners.com. If you go to them and use the top secret code DA30, you'll get 30% off any orders over $50. And the exciting thing is, I'm using a lot of their hardware in this aircraft, and I'm gonna kinda of explain why I use the size and type of hardware that I put into this plane. So, the fuselage um, is made out of the pink foam you buy at a hardware store, and it was all half inch thick. And I, I wanted to try to build the entire airplane out of the styrofoam. But where I made the mistake is for the fuselage, it's fine. For the wing, it's actually just too heavy. Now, that's relative to you as a designer. If you're a scratch builder like me, and what I mean by scratch builder is you invent your own airplane. Okay, now I know a lot of scratch builders say, oh no, Damon, I'm a scratch builder because I built something from Nick Zeroli plans. To me, you're a plan builder because the drawings have already been made. Okay, you don't have to do any design work on that aircraft, except maybe where you're putting your radio or other things. A true scratch builder is going to build and design completely from scratch, and that's only my definitions for me. I know other people will disagree, and that's fine. You're allowed to disagree. So basically, I started off with some pink foam, 
and I wanted to have a floor that had like a subfloor or that it had uh, sleepers in the floor. The reason I wanted to do that is if I want to put servos in that cavity for latches or controls or things to drop cargo, whatever. There's going to be a tray that slides into this airplane that will either have like a conveyor belt for dropping cargo. It may have the rail system like I've designed on my old C-130. But there's going to be different modules that will go into this eight foot long cargo bay. And um, yeah, so um, I built the um, bulkheads like this, uh, put on the side walls. And you can see that little uh, sleeper system in the floor there to put servos and stuff. So basically the fuselage did exactly what I wanted to do. The landing gear, and I designed my own torsion bar system. This is the torsion bar system using fiberglass rods and it worked really good. This is it sitting on its legs with some uh, prototype tail feathers, which it is going to look like this, but I haven't made up my mind if it's gonna be like a T-tail or if it's gonna be a, a regular horizontal stabilizer on it yet. I haven't gotten there yet. Um, the nose gear is really slick, super strong. I 3D printed everything on it. Well, not everything, but most of the components. Um, I did some test videos where I bottomed out the system on purpose to see if anything would break. And, and that's one thing I want you to understand. In my test videos, you'll see things tested, but if it doesn't break, it passed the test, okay? This is it sitting on its legs. And everybody, this this is a a big a big dumb plane. And we thought about calling it like the BDP, I think it was, but it's called the Frymastein. And if you don't understand, my daughter's name's Emma. So I got the MSL1, the MSL2, Fra Emmestein. So originally this was a fantasy plane that the Germans would have built that could have carried something like 10,000 troops or uh, 500 horses uh, with soldiers on the back, all this crazy crap I made up. But the cargo bay will be eight feet long and uh, it'll be able to carry roughly 30 to 40 pounds of ballast. And I will get my AMA waiver for whatever the ballast load is, okay? Because that's what the ultimate flying weight could be. This is the nose gear design that I did in Fusion 360. Here's the nose gear uh, just in its raw form, just steering and stuff. This is a uh, shot from the side of the fuselage sewing the front and rear cowlings and the spinners and the three bladed props I've got. Those are carbon fiber props. This is showing the uh, aft uh, cargo door. It actually opens and closes like a garage door. It's literally slick, but it slides up a track and opens and closes. And I'm gonna do a video on all this as I, I start to complete it. Keep in mind the fuselage is painted white right now. So the fuselage is basically done. I stripped of all the hardware when I put it on pause because all the hardware was mock-up hardware. It wasn't flight hardware, okay? Now the wing is the part that gave me my problem and it wasn't mechanical, it was the weight. This ended up being a big, heavy, just like plutonium turd. I mean, this was just heavy. And it, 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 everybody got mad at me for putting the plane on hold, but I have very specific uh, goals when I build my model airplanes, and it's my money, it's my time. And, and believe me, all my planes fly wonderfully, so just be patient with me, okay? Um, the center section of the wing and the nacelles is one part of the airplane that will bolt the fuselage. Here was, I, I was playing around with 3D printing some different spinner shapes. I'm not going to use this, but this just shows you kind of the intake. Uh, I mean, the cowlings and the, and the way the nacelles look. Big ass nacelles, by the way. Um, and this shows the rear nacelles a little bit closer. Here's another picture of the tail of the airplane. And here's me 3D printing one of the forward nacelles to make a mold from. I actually made a mold and was able to pull that fiberglass, which was a lot lighter than the 3D printed part. Here's another picture of that center section of the wing. So here's a little bit more about the wing. The wings have leading edge devices. They have spoilers that come up off the top of the wing, huge long flaps, and then little bitty ailerons. And I have learned in designing my aircraft that when you're slow is when you need the most, well, this makes sense. When you're slow is when you need the mo most control of your wings. When you're going fast, little bitty ailerons will fly you just fine. But when you're getting slow and you need a lot of input, but if you want really big flaps to give you a lot of lift to really slow the plane down, your ailerons get really small. Well, that's the reason I put the spoilers on these. And these spoilers will work as um, 
roll devices, but they'll also come up as air brakes. And quite frankly, I could bring them up to half as an air brake and still have enough deflection to control the roll of the airplane, okay? So here's a picture of them both deployed, both in the wing. This is all 3D printed parts. Can't remember how many servos, but there's a bunch of servos in here. We can probably count them. Yeah, there's four servos in that bay right there that's running a, a torque rod. And that torque rod's moving arms that will deploy the uh, brakes or spoilers. And the way those are designed is when they're completely deflected, there'll be zero load on the servo, just using mechanical advantage. This is looking down in there with the, uh, actually the uh, spoiler off. This is looking down the bay. And I'm getting text and I need to see what they're about. Okay, nothing important. Sorry about that. Well, it's important, but it's not going to stop the video. Now, this was a big, big controversy that I got when I was building this airplane two or three years ago. And I'll, I don't know how, how to even explain the frustration level. This, this got to me and I should never have gotten to it because I knew what I was doing. But I want all of my... Let me back up for a minute. When you're designing, you need to know 100% how certain things work. And there's been so much garbage and turds out there on RC groups, Flying Giants, and Google about where you place your electronic speed control, the battery, and the motor. And I've made a video on this, but the distance between the speed controller and battery is critical. There are capacitors in there, and the way the speed controller works is it opens and closes so many million times a second or whatever it is but every time it's open and closing it's hammering power so your capacitors are there to take that hammering out so you got a battery here the longer you make the battery the more that that wire holds the hammering and the harder it is on your speed controller so whatever the length of the wire comes on your speed controller and the length of the battery that comes on the battery is what you should use as your norm your start point now you can lengthen that a little bit and add capacitors, but it's much easier to add the wire between the electronic speed controller and the motor. Now, if you get too far out, you can get a timing issue with the way the motor starts. But I've tested this system at eight feet of wire on each speed controller to my motors and it worked flawlessly. I'm not gonna have eight feet in this airplane, but that's what I tested. So I 3D printed some parts for my speed controller and then put these fans on, and these fans will plug into a completely different battery circuit so that they're cooling the ESCs when there's no air going in the little intake, so my fuselage. So these electronic speed controls and fans actually live in the front of my fuselage where the flight pack batteries are gonna go, up by the cockpit, okay? There are gonna be air intake scoops on the top of the fuselage that will bring fresh air in, and then little bitty vents on the side of the fuselage that will let the fresh air out but we will still need a little bit of fan uh, cooling of those ESCs to keep them from going into a high temperature shutdown. In my testing, and I did a video on this, you can go back and find it, I ran the motors at a minute, two minutes, three minutes, and five minutes at full throttle with and without fans. At five, well, at three minutes at full throttle without fans, it went into the high temperature shutoff and shut off the ESC. It's not good on it, it got hot. With the fans on, I could run them at full power until my battery went down to 3.7 volts and it didn't hurt anything. Now, when you think about how many servos are on this airplane, it's insane, okay? This is how many servos do my leading edge devices, my spoilers, my elevator, my rudders, um, the um, uh, bomb release or the cargo release, nose gear steering, everything, a boatload of servos and this will be an S bus system. And here's a picture, a bad picture of the airplane sitting in my garage where I just test fit and test all the systems. Everything worked right. A week later I painted the glass and painted the fuselage, glass and painted the wings, and that's when I realized it was really out of control and weight. And that's when it went to storage. Here's a picture of the fuselage painted white. And I had a mock-up of the T-tail, which I still don't know if I'm going to go there. It looks really cool. But I normally will build a very small model of something like this to make sure the T-tail and everything works. So I'm a little bit scared because I haven't built that model. And honestly, I'm too much uh, Mr. Pre Procrastination have bit me and I'm too lazy and all of that to build a model of this to test it. I think I'm close enough and it's going to work. I, I really do. 
But that's pretty much this video, everybody. The Frommestein is a very important project to me. I had a lot of people super excited about it when I put it on pause. And quite frankly, a lot of people got upset with me again. Why are you doing this? Why do you build an airplane to 80 or 90% and then stop? There's just something about the way my mind's wired that the moment it starts to go off the rails, I walk away from it. So I can re recover, rethink, redesign. The new wings are about 95% designed. I'm going to do a video on that soon. You're going to love it because it's going to be built on a jig table just like I did my ultralight. Uh, the ribs will be. Um, the leading edge devices, I still have all those 3D printed, ready to go. Uh, the spoilers, I have to re-3D print some parts on that because I'm going to redesign a couple of things. Uh, the flaps and ailerons are staying the same square inches, except the flaps are going to work like the B36 where they have the swing arm method. So I'm definitely going to go there. And um, it will have brakes. And... Uh, it's going to drop between 30 and 50 pounds of cargo, depending on what the finished weight is. I don't want to go over the 77 pounds. I don't want to have this LMA2 under the AMA. I'm going to keep it LMA1, which is 77 pounds, 3 ounces, or whatever, and under. And I want the dry weight of the airplane to be about 40 pounds, 45 pounds. And then I can stack cargo up to the 77 and be LMA1. So thanks for watching my videos, everybody. You know, I always end with these talking about youth and aviation. Please get, um, please get as many younger people as you meet in a model aviation that are future. If you're an old fart or an old timer that treats people like crap, go play golf. Um, you know, go back and have tea with um, uh, MacArthur or somebody. You know, just go back to wherever you came from and leave the 11 to 30 year old people alone. Um, our hobby needs youth. Most old timers or old farts wouldn't build a Frankenstein type airplane like this, which I'm calling my Fra Emma Stein. Uh, this is a nut project. I have no idea if it's going to work. I have a good suspicion it will work, but until that day I crack the throttles open and take it off, I have no idea how this thing is going to even behave. I don't know if having flat sides on a fuselage is going to affect the way it flies in the air. Um, there's a couple of full-scale airplanes that have flat sides and they fly fine. So we'll see. So thanks for watching the video, everybody. And this is just the overview video, okay? Hopefully by this weekend, the fuselage will be back in my house. I know this sounds crazy, but I got to cut it in half to get it back down to my shop, but I'm going to make it so I can take it apart and put it together. And it's not one permanent fuselage that's like 13 feet long. So people are going to freak when I cut the fuselage in half. But I've got all the plans and I figured out how I'm going to join it. All of that's already figured it out. And the wings are 99% redesigned. And you'll see that in an upcoming video. So thanks for following me. Please like and subscribe if you haven't. I'm really trying to build my YouTube. And I'll see you next time, folks. Have a great night. Be safe. Take care of each other and rock on. See you.